Just Outdoors is brought to you in part by Jervalin Hardware Hank, Deer River. Jervalin Hardware offers a broad selection of paints and sporting goods and a complete line of plumbing and electrical supplies. Jervalin Hardware, 108 Main Avenue, Deer River. Hi folks, my name is Tom Chapin and welcome to ICTV Just Outdoors. And this Just Outdoors program today is going to involve owls, as you can see plainly on the table here. And the owls are a product of um, some mounts that our guest Eben Spencer brought with him. And Eben is a person that has been kind of following owls and studying owls as kind of a hobby on the side. Uh, for quite a few years, and he's going to inform us about owls of Minnesota. And so that's what this program is about. And I think there's going to be a lot to learn today. And welcome to the show, Evan. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate you coming down. You live uh, uh, kind of north of Grand Rapids, about 20 miles or so, uh, in an area that's pretty wooded. Yes, we, uh, my wife and I live on a small lake about five miles north of Balsam Lake, about 30 miles northeast of Grand Rapids. Okay. And we've been there for a number of years and we live in some heavily wooded areas and get opportunity to see and hear wolf, uh, wolves and wolves owls. Wolves and owls, yeah. And, <laughs> and a lot of other animals you're, as well. You're, you're right in the middle of everything there. You yeah. bet. Okay, so uh, I guess what we want to do to start with is uh, you're going to inform us about owls, so you have knowledge of owls. Uh, tell us a little about your background and then after that, how you got into this is kind of a hobby. Okay, sure. I grew up in the Duluth area, and my wife grew up in St. Paul. Uh, we, have, we bought property in 2007 on our lake. And before that, we were located in northwestern Minnesota in the little town of Oslo, Minnesota, population 400 or so, or less. We were right on the Red River. We looked down at our front window and saw North Dakota. And it was a wonderful opportunity to see wildlife. That, that Red River of the North flows exactly north and south, and it's a great corridor for seeing wildlife. And we did see a lot of owls, and that's kind of where I first became uh, interested in owls. I guess I've got a background in uh, the natural sciences. I, I have a degree from the University of Minnesota in plant and animal science mm -hmm. from St. Paul. And I've just always been interested in the, in the great outdoors and the natural sciences. So. I got my first owl, I obtained my first owl in 2001, which was the little sawwit owl that we see here. Okay, this little beauty right here. It's one of the smaller owls that, that you're that is, see, right? That is one of the smallest owls that we have in North America, yes. Yes. Definitely the smallest in Minnesota. And definitely there's uh, quite a few of them around. There is, they're, pretty, yeah. they're pretty common. Yeah, we'll get into uh, these later, the ones you have here, sure. we'll talk about them. But anyway, you're uh, now into the owls. I have a, a federal permit and a state permit, and in order to possess these owls, these are non-game birds, they're protected, fully protected, and in order to have these owls, I have to have my federal and state of Minnesota permit. Even in a mounted condition? Even in a mounted That's condition. Yeah. Uh, I've talked to uh, taxidermists who have said that if they could mount anything and everything, non-game birds, non songbirds would be half their business. So they, they are, they're protected for a reason. Yeah, and uh, you know, these birds are, uh, don't belong to you. They belong to the, basically the federal government. Don't sure, they? right. Yeah, okay. Right. Sure. So I've got my permit. Um, I was on the board of directors of a chapter of the Audubon Society out in northwestern Minnesota, and they helped me get my first permit. And one of the requirements for that permit is that I have to display my owls for educational purposes, presentations like this one, periodically throughout the year. Mm -hmm. 
I'm also a Minnesota firearm safety instructor, so I saw that as a perfect opportunity to get my permit, to get my owls, and display them. So I would uh, teach firearm safety kids roughly 11, 12, 13 years old, yeah. and I would bring my owl in in a box like this, and <laughs> my littlest owl, my first owl, I'd bring it in a box like this, and I would tell the kids, if you can guess what's in this box, you don't have to take the final exam. And of course, they were all pretty worried pretty about, about. They that. were all pretty worried about that yeah. final exam. And I had my little tape recorder back then, before the days of computers and so on and so forth. And I would play a recording of the little sawit. I wouldn't tell them what it was, and I'd say, "If you can guess what this is," and I'd Sounds walk. Sounds like something you'd hear on a highway. <laughs> I, I had <laughs> everybody guess what it was. Nobody ever got it. But they guessed everything from a giraffe to, uh, to some whatever. And I, we're still trying to figure out how you get a giraffe in that little box, but yeah. nobody ever guessed it. But there are people that have probably heard that that never identified what it was. Right. And, right. and we, we'll, we'll talk about the sawwit sure. and the sound later on, sure. but it's a pretty unique sound. Well, every, every owl has different sounds. Exactly. And we're going to be getting into that. Exactly. We'll hear about that. Exactly. So. Okay. So you've, you've gotten that far. We're going to talk about... Uh, there's 12 different species of owls that inhabit, at one time or another, Minnesota. Correct. Is that correct? That's correct. Some of them are migratory. Mm -hmm. They come through Minnesota and they spend some time, and other ones uh, stay here year-round. There are resident owls, yes, and some are migratory to a certain extent. And then we get owls during eruption years, and we can talk about that too. Okay, what's an eruption year? An eruption is when we get a very dramatic sudden increase in the population density of a, of a species. And when we're talking about owls or birds, we're referring to birds moving from north to south, coming into Minnesota in larger numbers than normal. I think there's folks that can remember uh, back, I, I'm thinking it was like 15 to 20 years ago, we had, well, I guess what you'd call an eruption of uh, great gray and snowy owls, uh, particularly along Highway 2 on the way to Duluth. People would, would talk about that for years. Yes. How many owls they saw that particular year. I guess the question I would have is uh, uh, why that particular species, those two species of owls, that was an eruption, I would say. Correct. And what caused it? There are four different owl species that are subject to eruption in Minnesota. The one that gets the most attention, of course, is the snowy owl. This, it right. stands on, it's so big and it's so unique. Yes. That's the one that gets the attention. But there are also eruption years that involve great, uh, great gray, the, mm -hmm. big, the biggest owl that we have in North America, the tallest. It, uh, the northern um, so, uh, the northern hawk owl, excuse me, and the uh, what's the fourth one, the boreal owl. Those four owls are ones that we typically see during an eruption year, and there's different reasons for it. It's not as simple as we used to think. We used to think it was completely dependent that we saw the snowy owls and they were on the verge of starvation, but that is not the case. In most cases, snowy owls that come down in an eruption year are perfectly healthy. Eighty percent of them are perfectly healthy. Oh. But uh, so some of the things that we used to believe aren't quite yeah. as true. Everybody says lemmings and lemmings and, and right. And all that stuff. What they're finding is that when the snow has come down, it is the result of a large population of lemmings or their main prey. The snow is main prey is lemmings the previous year. So when there's a high number of lemmings one year, there's a lot of offspring that survived. Consequently, the following oh. year, we see a large number of snowy is coming down, and quite often those are juveniles. Most kind of, of those... the opposite of what people think. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then the, the boreal owl, the northern hawk owl, the great gray, they come down to a certain extent every year, but during an eruption, they can tend to be the result of, of uh, food shortages and more closer to uh, a star what we think of starvation. Okay. But not necessarily the case with snowies and much more involved than we always have thought in the past. Yeah, interesting, because a lot of people want to see these owls, and they aren't really that uh, prevalent around here, no, are they're, they? No, they're not. And if the you do see them, they're going to be during the winter, isn't that correct? Correct. The snowy yeah. does like more open areas. You can imagine its native area is north of the Arctic Circle, yes. way up way up in the Arctic, up in the tundra, and they're not real comfortable in wooded areas. So they like uh, western Minnesota into the Dakotas. We used to see them every year in the Dakotas quite a bit. They're also uh, fairly common down in the Duluth area, down in the bay on the, on the frozen harbor. You can see them there, but not quite as much in the, in the wooded area like we see here. They like that open country. 
Is it possible that when you do see them, they seem to be so tame? They, 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 aren't, they don't seem to fear humans. Is it because they've never seen humans? I think so. I've heard, people, they, they I've heard, people, I've heard people say that they, they just never dealt with humans in the no, past. That far north. And uh, just aren't concerned. Aren't concerned, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think the great greys were the same way when they came down because they, you could actually go right up to them on a fence post and they just sit there and look at you. Right. And so that kind of tells you a little bit about the habitat that they probably came from, right? Right, exactly. It's just, it's exactly. Nothing around there. So, you know, okay, quickly, what what do they eat when they're uh, anywhere where they are? Again, uh, up north, is it just mainly mice and lemmings and things the, like that? The, the snow is ninety five percent of the diet consists when they're in their native area in a normal year. Ninety five percent of the diet consists of lemmings. They are opportunistic. They will feed whatever they can. When lemmings are short, they will actually, they've actually been seen flying out over the ocean, over open water, oh. catching ducks as oh. large oh. as mergansers and other large birds. They've got excellent developed uh, claws or talons for catching not only small mammals, but also some of the larger ones as well. Yeah, well, let's see. What do we got here? I have a talon here. This talon is from a red-tailed hawk. Mm -hmm. And somewhere hiding under there is a. This is. And this talon from is. An owl. This so. talon is from a great horned owl, and you can see the difference in the two talons. They all have the four talons, three facing forward and one facing back. That's common with all okay. all the owls, and one of the talons can actually rotate to the back when it's holding a prey or catching a prey. So there, there's a lot of flexibility there. But one interesting thing here is that you can see that the the, the talon or the whole leg from the great, from the um, red-tailed hawk, excuse me, from the red-tailed hawk doesn't have the fur, doesn't have the hair or the feathers protecting it. That's why the hawk has to fly south. It wouldn't do too well on, a, you know, like last week sure. at 30 below, <laughs> it would not last very long. The owls that are in our area that stay here have those heavy feathers, that heavy insulation to help protect them. So they're right at home, whether they're up in a tree at 40 below or driving in the snow at 30 below, they, uh, they have no problems. Uh, as large as those are, they can do an awful lot of damage to even a bigger mammal. Yeah. Uh, it looks like they could even grab a woodchuck or something like that. You know, one of the favorite foods of the great horned is skunks. Oh my goodness. And you can imagine what would happen if a wolf or a fox tried to eat a skunk. You know, it would get about halfway through yeah. and say enough of that. But most birds, including owls, cannot smell. So the great horn can catch a skunk and eat it with no problem and eat another one the next day. But um, yes, the talons are very highly specialized. There's actually four different types of talons. The snowy owl has very, very curved talons, as I was saying, to catch larger birds and small birds. Some of the talons on some of the smaller owls are more adapted to catching insects. Insects oh, is one of the wow. fairly common foods that, sure. that owls will eat. Okay. The larger owls tend to eat uh, well, their favorite food would be mice and voles, mm -hmm. lemmings in the case of snowies, but they will eat uh, the, the barred owl that we have over here. He will actually eat uh, fish. They've been known to, they've been seen wading in the water, catching crayfish and small fish. The snowy has been actually seen next to uh, open water up north, waiting to catch fish. So they will eat whatever they can find. They'll eat salamanders and insects, mm -hmm. um, other birds. The barred owl is actually does quite well in urban areas and in some of the larger cities. And they find that the predominant prey for the barred owl is small birds. When the birds are nesting at night, the barred owl goes in and catches these small birds and then brings them back to the nest yeah. and feeds them. Barred owl seems to uh, be, as far as I remember through the years, one of the most common owls in the area, would that be right? Yes, barred, barred, barred owls are pretty common throughout our area and most of Minnesota. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about the sounds that owl makes compared to other ones. Great. It's very prominent and you remember it. We'll talk about that later. But one more thing on the, uh, the physical makeup of an owl and let's say a hawk. Um, there's a reason why the owls are so quiet when they fly. Yes. Isn't that correct? Yep. There and is. it has something to do with the wings, doesn't it? Yes. Do you want to describe that? Yes. There are very, very specialized feathers in the wings. This is the wing of a great horned owl. 
as we see here. And for one thing, it's very large and broad in comparison to, in rel relative to its body weight. More so than like a hawk or some of the other mm -hmm. owls or some of the other birds, excuse birds, me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that broad, heavy, wide wing gives it the ability to fly pretty much effortlessly without flapping. So they're not disturbing anything. But they've also got very specialized feathers. They've got leading feathers on the front of the wing here that break up the sound. Mm -hmm. And they've got feathers behind that further break up, specialized feathers back here, that further break that sound and then absorb any remaining sound. What a difference between that and the red-tailed hawk then. Yes, you can see the you difference can see in, in what you size. were describing there, those parts are not on the right. wing of the red-tailed hawk or the, hawk. The red tail versus the great horn. Yeah, interesting. Um, hawks and owls, predatory birds, they're not real closely related, are they? They're all raptors, but um, hawks and, and yeah. but not not other than that. No, they're different genuses altogether. They're, they're different genus, different species, different family, different order. I understand right. exactly. They go right. up the classification, right? And they separate quite high there. Yes. And uh, so uh, they're, they're a, a, really a totally different species. They uh, are hawks, all hawks, and then all they are. They're talking about a different animal altogether here. There are. 234 species of owls in the world. Wow. And I'm not sure how and many. We only have 12? Well, it's, we, only, <laughs> we only have 12, but interestingly enough, it has been said that if you want to see all the owls in the United States, you go to Minnesota or you go to Arizona. Southwestern Arizona, southeastern Arizona, excuse me, down in the portal area is an excellent area to see owls. A lot of those are migratory. Down in the Chiricahua Mountains, and uh, my wife and I were down there last spring and were able to see some of the owls that we don't have here. A lot of them migrate into Mexico and they weren't back yet. We were a little bit early. The best time to get down there is mid-April. It's a, it's a birder's paradise. So they live there in the summer they're and there they in migrate the in the winter to uh, Mexico. Me, some, most of the species there do migrate to Mexico, <laughs> Mexico. yes. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. interesting. I guess it gets too cold for them, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, this is interesting. Um, I guess uh, let's start on the, the 12 types of owls that people okay. may see in Minnesota. Right. Now, the chances of them seeing all 12 are pretty remote, but maybe three or four are available. Definitely. That, that might be seen throughout your life in Minnesota, especially if you know what to look for and also what to hear. Right? Most definitely. The, yeah. sound, the sound is what okay. most people identify owls by. Okay. Very well, seldom do we actually see owls. They, they hide so well, they're yeah. so well camouflaged that it's hard to see them. Most of them feed at night, don't they? Yes, mo owls are mostly nocturnal. There are diurnal or daytime feeders, and we can talk about that too. But most owls are with those excellent eyes and that excellent hearing, they can hear roughly 10 times better than humans. So with that totally silent flight, the excellent hearing, the excellent eyesight, they prefer the nighttime. Nighttime, okay. Let's see what we got. Okay. Well, we've got 12 owls in Minnesota, as I mentioned. The first owl that, and I'll just go through them alphabetically sure. and talk a little bit about each one, and I'll try and spend a little bit more time on the owls that we have in northeastern mm -hmm. Minnesota and Grand Rapids area. But starting with the barn owl, the barn owl is uh, common in southern Minnesota, not so much here. As a matter of fact, it's not even very common down there. I read an article that they saw or they confirmed a nest in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin this past summer, the first time in 20 years they had a confirmed sighting of barn owls, so they're not real common. I never would have thought that. It's the most common owl in the world, barn owl is. And not to be confused, <laughs> sometimes people will get confused barn and bard, yes, two, two know, different right, species yeah, altogether. Is... But this is the barn owl that we have. Um, it's a mid-sized owl, roughly 20 inches tall. A unique feature about the barn owl is it has brown eyes. You'll notice that in most of the other owls, they have yellow eyes, but barn owls have the, the brown eyes. Mm -hmm. They also mate for life, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, and they have that uh, kind of heart-shaped face. Yes. That puts them in a little different category it's, than the other ones. It's easily it's recognizable. More, yeah, 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 it's got a different yeah, appearance different altogether, family, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Interesting. So, boy, once you see those, you'd be able to identify them. But, but all owls have that, that flat face and that facial disc that we see and the eyes that look straight ahead. And it gives the appearance that they're looking right at us. Yeah. And many times we tend to think of them reminding us of ourselves. <laughs> How often do you hear someone saying, oh, he or she is a wise old owl? Yeah. 
and <laughs> owls are, are pretty unique. Tell us about turning the head. Owls, that's, that's a big they, they have excellent eyes. They can see um, a long ways away and capture their prey, but they can't move their eyes. Their eyes are stationary in their head, and they can rotate, their, to compensate for that, they can rotate their head 270 degrees wow. from right to left. And it kind of gives people the, the impression yeah, that they can turn their heads all the way around. And that's, yeah. that's a, a very yeah, common 270 question. 270 degrees. <laughs> 270 <laughs> degrees yeah. is, is plenty. And it's so quick, it almost makes them look like they're, they're yeah. turning their head all the way around. But they, their eyes are, are stationary. They can't okay. move them. Sounds good. The second owl in northeastern Minnesota is the boreal owl, B-O-R-E-A-L. And true to its name, it prefers an area further north of us. We don't see a lot of boreal owls in Minnesota. It's much more comfortable in the boreal forests of Canada. Mm -hmm. But they do come down every year, and this is one that's subject to eruptions. So during the eruption years that you were talking about, you probably saw boreal owls between here and Duluth. We would see them pretty common from the North Shore, up the North Shore from Duluth to, uh, to Grand Marais area. We saw What's the size of them? They're a small owl, about 10 inches tall. Okay. And boreal owl is on every birder's dream list to see. Oh. For some For some reason, they're, they're pretty rare. Okay, they, and they kind of look like a small barred owl in a way. They, they, a small yeah. barred owl, yeah. They've got those bright yellow eyes yeah, and, and, and the, uh, the bars, that. but very small bird. So they both, they're pretty, very small, yeah, both yeah. a little bit bigger than the, the saw wood. Okay, all right, very good. Moving on then, and We'll see if we get this to advance. Is the barred owl? This is the one that we have over right here. There. The barred yeah. owl, is, as you say, is a, a common owl in eastern Minnesota, quite common throughout most of Minnesota. It too has the brown eyes that we see, unlike the yellow eyes in all the other species. And it's similar in size to a great horned, but it doesn't have, it has a rounded head. It doesn't have the ear tufts or the horns mm -hmm. that we see on, mm -hmm. on the great horned. And to identify, you just really look at the bars, right? The bars. Without the ears and, and the bars. That's and where it gets... That's, that's probably where, what it's going to be. And the brown eyes, but yeah. you know, pretty hard to see on the woods and at night. a special call, too, but we'll... It's got, it's got a very unique call, and we can talk about that in a, a second here. Sounds we'll good. play that, but okay. a very common owl in our area. Mm -hmm. Moving to western Minnesota, the burrowing owl. It's been, this, this little guy has been described as the pop can on stilts. <laughs> a very a pretty so, unique pretty pretty unique appearance it too is about 10 inches tall so it's one of the smaller owls it has yellow eyes it's found in the western prairies of minnesota well into canada and alberta saskatchewan you'll notice that it does not have the the feathers on the legs so it does need to migrate uh, it nests in holes it burrows right in and it will take advantage of somebody else's nest or holes uh, whether it be a badger hole or a coyote hole, they'll move right in and burrow uh, and lay their eggs right underground. How common out west? Not very common. It's, no. it's, a, it's a, uh, an animal of special concern. Matter of fact, I was reading about or listening to a webinar about burrowing owls in Saskatchewan and Alberta. And over the last 10 years, they have lost 95% of their burrowing owls. So yeah. they're, they're quite concerned. Uh, man caused, I'm sure. Loss of habitat seems That's to be driving everything. Every it's just, yeah. like, just like every time, as yeah. you well know. Yeah, so uh, that would be kind of a birder's dream to see one of these. That would be. That would be. There was some reintroduction efforts back in the mid-80s to try oh. and bring some back, and, and it, very limited success. Really? Wow. Okay. Didn't know we had those. The Eastern Screech Owl. Mm -hmm. Now the screech owl, I guess I've heard them. They're kind of rare, but maybe it, more so in, in found much more commonly in southern Minnesota, southern and western Minnesota. Sure. And there's two types of screech owls that we have in the U.S. One being the eastern screech, which we have here. The western screech would be in Arizona. They're uh, again a smaller owl, about 10 inches tall. And they have a very unique, interesting call, a, a kind of a trill, a descending trill. And once you hear that, uh, you'll, you won't forget it. It's like a bobcat. Yeah. Yeah, okay. You don't forget that either. No. <laughs> All right, that's into screech owl. It looks almost like a great horn, only uh, half the size, right? Very much so, yes. Okay. Yep. Right. The great gray. Wow. One of everybody's favorite owls. Yeah. The great gray is definitely an owl of the north woods. This is the largest owl that we have in North America. It's almost the size of a small golden retriever. It's about 33, <laughs> 36 inches tall. Matter of fact, it's the tallest owl in the world. I don't think it's quite the largest, but it's definitely the tallest. 
And again, we are at the very southern range of the Great Gray. They are much more comfortable up in the North Woods. Uh, Arctic certain, too? Uh, pardon me? In the Not as far as the Arctic, Arctic but okay. uh, southern Canada and in, in the heavy wooded area right. swamps mm -hmm. and, and black spruce swamps. We do have a certain number of Great Gray that come down every year. People ask me, where can we see owls? And if they want to see a Great Gray, my recommendation is the Sax Zim Bog. The friend, yeah. Friends of the Sax Zim Bog, they do an excellent job. Uh, located in Meadowlands, Minnesota, northeast of Duluth, northwest of Duluth a bit, about 25 miles. They do an excellent job and the chances of seeing a great gray there during the winter are, are pretty good, along with some of the other boreal owls and so on. It's quite an attract Pardon? attraction area for birders the, throughout the, that, the country. That big swamp there really yeah. is... Uh, and that's and, just starting right now, isn't it? Yes, so that, yes. Uh, January, yeah. February area. So. One distinguishing feature with the great gray is that white mustache right underneath the bill, or underneath the beak. That okay. gives it away every time. All right, from a distance you can From a distance that they, they stand down. Be, yeah. Besides the size. Yes, exactly. And I guess the question I have is, do these, uh, is, is their population uh, uh, go around the world as far as like in Russia and that area? that has the same kind of habitat? Uh, yes, it does. It I does. have um, I've attended some webinars put on by a biologist out of Norway that have yeah. studied great grays. And uh, there is a large sustaining population of great grays over in Norway and, and those countries as well, yes. Well, so we share yes, we those do. things too. And, and they are fascinating over there as yeah. well. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. They have, uh, I mentioned the, the hearing and the smell or the uh, the hearing of the owl, but those owls that rely more on their hearing tend to have a more pronounced facial disc, and you can see that in the great gray. And, and what's happening is the sounds coming in and being deflected or f uh, f directed towards the ears. The ears on an owl are right behind the eyes. Right and behind the eyes. Right, right behind right the eyes. Here. I've got a, a skull there that, that shows that. We can talk about that, but uh, people always ask, Don't are you these... Show that? Yeah. Are, People ask, are these, are these the ears? Yeah. And it's funny how these owls get their name, long-eared owl, short-eared owl. We talk about the great horn. They're not horns, they're not ears. They're just other purposes. But the ears are located right behind the eyes, at the same level as the eyes. And they're a little bit offset. And I do have a skull here from a great gray. I can take this off. This is from a great gray owl, as I mentioned, the largest owl. And you can see the size of the eyes. Mm -hmm. The size of the eyes can be anywhere between 1 and 5 percent of the total body weight, which is quite unique. Those eyes are made to see at night. They're not even, they're not, they're not even eyeballs. They're more a, a series of long tubes that uh, function, at, they give it that nocturnal vision. And uh, so that, the size and, and just gives it excellent eyesight. But then the hearing, as I say, the ears are right behind the eyes and they're a little bit offset. And one's a little bit higher than the other, one might be a little bit more forward than the other. That allows the owl to, uh, to find its prey better. The eyes are binocular, like humans. Unlike other birds, most other birds have eyes on the side of their head, they can see to the side. Owls have binocular vision where the line of vision of each eye overlaps about 40 degrees, I believe. That allows them to find and to, uh, to catch the prey that much better. Hmm. So again, it's a combination of those eyes, those ears, yeah. and the silent flight that makes them such excellent hunters. All these evolutionary challenges that came yeah, along just, and just uh, amazing, something isn't it? like this. Isn't huh? it amazing? Yeah. yeah. Yes, just it is. for habitat, has yes. to do with where they live, yeah. All right, great, okay, next. It's said that the great gray can catch its prey, vole, mainly voles, that's the main food of the great gray. It can catch its uh, prey under two feet of snow at 100 feet away, 100 yards away, I'm sorry. So hence those excellent ears. Ears, they can hear it, yeah. Wow. Sticking with northeastern Minnesota then, the most common owl in North America, the great horned owl, the great horn is found all the way from Canada throughout the United States into Central America and all the way far, as far south as Patagonia, South America. So a very, very common owl. And when we think of owls and picture them in our mind, this is probably the one that, that we think of. We got those tufts on top, yeah. the big bright yellow eyes looking directly at us and that very, very serious look. You mentioned about how aggressive owls can get defending their territory and it's been said that great 
horned owls will actually attack people if they get too close during that nesting period. They, can, they have a special sound too. They have a special Ooh. sound. Yeah. Some people say that it, um, it reminds them of uh, who's awake, me too, yeah. who's awake, me too. Ooh. Whereas the, the barred owl we talked about, who cooks for you, who cooks for you. Yeah. Pretty unique, unique sounds. This is uh, what they use to attract crows when crow hunters yes. are, are I, using a decoy. I remember that, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I remember people using live owls yeah, I don't yeah. know, I don't think that's quite legal, is it? Yeah, it's not legal now, but it was back in the 50s and early 60s. When we were uh, kids, uh, yes. That, they were unprotected. This was the only owl prior to the 60s that was uh, unprotected. You know, uh, all the other owls were, but mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they left this open for quite a long time until they finally protected them, I think, in probably in about 1973. Did they? Yeah, it went that far. I had a friend in Duluth that had owls. She had a snowy and, and other owls as well. She was quite an avid birder. And she never had permits back then. No. It wasn't, wasn't required. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there, there were times. Yes, yeah. you bet. And, uh, so. Things are always changing. All right. The long-eared owl. Now that would be hard for me to identify this one. I mean, it looks so much like some of the other owls that we just talked about. Is it, do you go by size? I have never seen a, a long-eared oh, no. owl, <laughs> and to me, it looks very similar to a great horned. Yes, but it's about the size of a crow, so uh, not quite half. If the great yeah. horned owl is roughly 22 inches tall, this is more like in that 14 inches tall range. But the eyes? The eyes very similar. Similar. Yep. Um, the yellow eyes and the and the tufts on top. Yes, so that would be a. The only way you go by is size. Yes, that's if it looks like a baby great horned owl, it's probably a long eared owl. Well, I believe so. <laughs> okay. As I say, I've never, never seen them. Seen they are common or found in our area, yeah. uh, all the way almost down to southwestern Minnesota. But uh, all have of you, Have you talked to anybody who's ever seen one? I have talked to people that have seen them, yes, but I have never been so fortunate okay. that I know of. Maybe I've seen yeah. other owls so I didn't recognize. Are they a northern Canadian? They're, they do go into Canada they go all, throughout all of north, northern and northeastern and eastern Minnesota, even southeastern Minnesota. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Long-eared owl. The long-eared owl. Wow. You and I were talking about the northern hawk owl and how yes. unique it is in the fact oh. that for one thing it flies more like a hawk and it looks more like a hawk the way it leans forward like that. Most people would say that's a hawk if they just glanced at it because of the leaning right. angle. Right. Yep. Owls like this, yes. Hawks like that, exactly. But that's why they call this a hawk owl. It has no, all no, its the, characteristics of an owl. The northern hawk owl, yes. A, yeah. It is an owl. Very northern bird, right? Yes, they too are uh, fairly rare, quite rare in Minnesota. They're found more in southern Canada, north of the border. Yeah. Although uh, in my old job, I had uh, quite a few of these turned into me. Did you over over time? Yes, they'd find an owl and kind of describe it, and I say, boy, it sure sounds like a hawk owl, and it was, you know, so probably had six or seven of them over a 30-year span, huh. you know, which yeah. was kind Inter of interesting. Interesting, Most yes. Know what they were. They are, uh, they're a mid-sized owl, about 18 yeah. inches tall, and again, they're seldom seen in Minnesota, but when they are seen, they're seen during the day. The northern hawk owl does hunt, it's diurnal, it does hunt during the day, unlike most other owls hunting at night. And I've actually talked to people, it's apparently it's just like some of the others you mentioned, it's not afraid of humans. I've talked to people that have been walking down the trail in the woods and had the northern hawk owl following yeah. along behind them, landing from tree to tree to tree. Didn't seem to be bothered by the humans at all. That would be in the winter. Uh, yes. yes. Yes, and so that means that when they do that, when they have that sense, that they're probably a really northern bird, farther yes. north, maybe almost into the... Arctic area. Just so. haven't dealt with humans a lot. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, maybe the leaning has something to do with uh, them uh, feeding and looking for uh, uh, food during the day. That could be. You know, something that they can see better when they're leaning, rather than at night. So, I don't know. Um, anyway, he's got a guess at it. Yes. <laughs> they, too, are uh, one of the owls that's subject to eruptions in Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I've seen most of my owls during that eruption year. I don't remember exactly which year it was, as you were saying, but uh, between Duluth and Grand Marais, I think we saw four or five in one day, wow. along, with those, greats, yeah. along with the great grays yeah. and, and the snowies. Yeah. As we mentioned, the, the northern sawweed owl, the smallest owl that we have in Minnesota, it's not the smallest owl in the United States. That would be the elf owl. 
and that's found in Arizona. Arizona, area. of course, yes. But the Sawit is the smallest owl that we have east of the Mississippi River. Um, it's about seven or eight inches tall. That's the owl that we have here. Mm -hmm. And these guys are these guys are fascinating. They re they really are. They they are very tame. They've got those yellowish to orangish eyes. Some people say up closer to Grand Marais, the eyes are a little bit more orangish. I don't know if that's <laughs> quite true or not, but they do have those yellow eyes. And they've got a very, very interesting call. It's a long series of short notes or toots, and it goes on and on and on, and, and we can play that sound. But they tend to be quite tame. When I was a kid, I had a sawit land on the end of my rifle when I was deer hunting. And I have a good friend in Oslo, Minnesota, western Minnesota, that was deer hunting on a stand out in the open, and he had a sawit try and land on his head. And it tried, came in and tried to land on his head, and just at the last second he flinched because it scared him. And instead it landed about two feet away on the, on the railing of the deer stand and looked right at him and then flew off. And Wouldn't that be a problem with survival? It can be. I have seen <clears throat> sawwits in, in our yard that, uh, I, for whatever reason, they were just sitting out in the tree. And believe me, in Oslo, Minnesota, it got cold and windy and snowstorms, and we tried to bring it inside, and it, it died. I wonder if it would uh, be food for other owls. <laughs> that's, you know, <laughs> owls live, the, lar the larger owls live about 10 years. I think the snowy, they say, lives about 12, in the wild, of course. The snowy lives about 12 years, the great horned and the barred owl live in that 9 to That's 10 maximum or average? Average, oh, right, average. That's a long time, I didn't it realize is. that, yeah. But the smaller owls, the sawwit, will live on the average about seven years. And one of the reasons for it, well, it has, has a hard time getting enough food, but one of the, it is food for other animals. Sure. Yes. It's the right size. Yes, food exactly. For, uh, easier, uh, easier to catch and, and to deal sure. with versus uh, the, the, the great horns or whatever. I, I, I think I've seen them, but I never, never thought about what I was looking at, I guess. It, uh, you can imagine that little sound that it makes, and it goes on and on and on, and it will drive you crazy after a while. You can imagine being camped out there and yeah. hearing that sound for hours after hours. And, <laughs> and I've had people say, that's what that sound is. I thought it was a truck backing up. I oh. thought it was a chainsaw. I thought it was some kind of engine. But no, it's a saw at all. Okay. Pretty unique call. Yeah. The short-eared owl. See if we can get this. We had the, we had the long-eared. It looked like a small great horn. The wow. short-eared short owl is a very common owl. It occurs throughout the world. And it, too, has the little ear tufts, although they can be hard to see. We don't have a lot of them in our area. They're, again, an owl of western Minnesota, the open prairies. They're a mid-sized owl, roughly 16, 18 inches tall. So they're a pretty so good size good owl. Size, pretty yeah. good size owl, you bet. The short-eared owl nests right on the ground. It does not burrow, it does not build its nest or anything. It nests right on the ground, right on, vulnerable. it's vulnerable to everything. The face looks like almost a barn owl. It, it has a very similar, uh, kind uh, of a heart uh, shape. Yeah, yeah, very similar. I have been out in the prairie of eastern North Dakota duck hunting and had these ears diving at me as I was out in the prairie. They did not like the fact that I was there. I did mention, or I should have mentioned, that I was employed as an agronomist for 35 years out in western Minnesota. And I was out in bean fields, edible bean fields, in June and had these short-eared owls diving at me, defending their nests. So they can get quite aggressive, quite defensive of, the, of their territory. Do any owls eat vegetation? They do some, but not a whole lot. Mostly most meat. Mostly insects. insects. They, will, they will eat some vegetation, but not a lot. Okay. They will also eat some carrion, some dead meat, but not a lot. But again, depending on the environment, depending on the conditions and the yeah. individual species, the diet is quite variable. But they will, they tend to be subject to eating anything they can find. Yeah, eat, you don't see a lot of uh, owls when you see a, like a car killed deer in the winter long. No. It's mostly the, the ravens and the eagles. Although they, uh, they say you do need to be careful because they will, car collisions can be a pretty common cause of death of owls, and what they're doing is they're feeding on the mice on the side oh, of the road, sure. and then they fly up. So you do see a fair number of owls fly up at night, and they're, they're after those yeah, owls, Years ago, uh, when they were hauling grain along Highway 2 mm -hmm. uh, on trucks, there'd be a lot of grain and a lot of, a lot of dead uh, raptors along Highway 2 right. for many, many years. I remember that, like yes. Cars, yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. All right. Uh, the the short-eared owl can be one that's migratory. Depending okay. on uh, on the pop, they're highly dependent on voles, 
And depending on that population of voles, they will migrate Looking if for food. the need it's arises. All, all about food. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Food and survival, right? The last owl that I have then is the snowy owl, the last number 12 owl of Minnesota. Everybody's favorite owl. This is the one that gets all the attention. The color. And with the color and what really gave him his fame was Harry, uh, Harry Potter and his owl Hedwig. And I believe Hedwig was a female. The snowies can be quite variable in their appearance. The older males will be all white. The younger males and the females will have the speckling or the dotting, the, the dots, the coloring that we see on, on that one. Mm -hmm. That owl came from, I should mention also that I received all my owls through the DNR, through sure. the Minnesota sure. DNR. Yeah. Um, for award educational me, purposes. For yeah. educational yeah. purposes. But I, um, I did get them through the DNR. That particular owl came from Bemidji. Yeah. And whether it was a result, of, it yeah. was being a, looks like a, a young male. It probably came down to an eruption year, and sure. I don't know what, what caused the death, but. Yeah, well, where a lot of these owls go, most of them do is for education is to schools. Right. They have displays. There's a couple of schools in the area that have great displays. St. Joseph's School has a, a really good display. And one of the better displays in uh, all of Minnesota, I think, is uh, the high school in North Home. Oh, is it? Uh, I used to work with an individual up there, and we'd get a lot of these owls, and we'd get them mounted for the schools. And, uh, boy, it's just a, just a great, that's almost a walk-in one up in North Home. It's oh, that really? big. It's huge, all glass. I'd like to get so up there and see if that. If you ever want to look at owls and look yes. at raptors, too, and yes. eagles, and uh, loons and those kind of birds, uh, that's couple good places to go. You've done quite a bit of taxidermy work yourself. Not a lot of it, but I did do some taxidermy work on things like this. Uh -huh. And so a lot of those ones that are mounted locally, are, I, I, I did the taxidermy okay. work. Yeah. So kind of fun. The snowy, as I mentioned, in a normal setting, in its normal area north of the Arctic Circle, 95% of its diet consists of lemmings. And lemmings, we talked about, uh, are a pretty interesting little thing. They're about the size of a mouse, as you well know. And they have been the subject of a lot of... Uh, a lot of tall tales, let's put it that way. Um, it used to, we used to believe, or we grew up, remember, thinking that mm -hmm. snowy owls were completely dependent on lemmings, and lemmings committed these mass suicides by <laughs> jumping off cliffs, which is not the case. In the 50s, Disney made a movie called White Wilderness, and they actually staged a mass migration, mass uh, suicide of lemmings. They actually pushed them off cliffs making it look like they were jumping into the ocean. And what they did, they actually filmed that portion of the film in Alberta. And they imported lemmings from above the Arctic Circle. They paid Inuit children to catch lemmings. They brought them down to Alberta, <laughs> pushed them off a cliff, made it look like they were uh, jumping off cliffs to kill themselves. And, uh, the, but the perception lives on. Yeah. It's so not some of those things in Hollywood aren't always <laughs> authentic. Is it? <laughs> and and uh, it's hard to get rid of that yeah, belief. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. We'll see you're but, so young. You know. But lemmings do yeah. have these wide population yeah. swings. I, yeah, wow. And uh, some years there's a lot. They, they actually have been known to swim across open water looking for new areas to, to inhabit. So but it's a matter of food for them, too. Exactly, too. right. Oh. So and difference when, in climate. When there's a lot of lemmings, the snowies have a very high success ratio. They can raise six, seven young, five, six, seven young very well. When there's fewer lemmings, they're not able to uh, sustain those. Do you, do you, uh, what's your thoughts on climate uh, change on some of these things that we've been talking about? I was reading um, the other day that up in the Arctic Circle, uh, black flies have become an issue because of the warming climate. And the black flies is, are seen as a threat to the snowies because they actually attack the young owlets when the mother is off feeding. And they will actually attack the, uh, the owlets and, and suck blood right out of them and kill them. So, yes, the climate is changing and uh, it has a, a lot of. Might have to do with the lemming population, too. It could be. Maybe. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, lo loss of sea ice is, is yeah. hard on, on the snowy owls. As I mentioned, the two calls in specific, the, 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 the sawwit owl and the, how it will go on and on and on and how people say, like I was saying, that's what I've been hearing. I've had more people come up to me through the years and say, that's exactly what I was hearing. We thought it was a truck backing up. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty unique call. And that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons I like having the sawwit is to show the sound that it makes because people really associate the, the two. And then the, the barred owl. As we were saying, that's the way most people um, uh, interact with owls. They hear them, but very seldom see them. 
and that bard all who cooks for you who cooks for you pretty unique and once you hear that and associate it with that you'll never forget it I think the sounds are as important as actually seeing the elements. Very much so. And we're, we'll get that on there some way. Good. Uh, which is great because the sound is just so unique. Uh, you know, hawks don't make many sound, they just squawk. And, uh, but owls all have a different sound. They do. And you can be sitting right in Grand Rapids or right in town, uh, Nashwalk, Minnesota, and you can hear these, these owls at night. You know, I've been giving these presentations for about 20 years. And I've had more people come up to me afterwards and say they saw this owl at their feeder and yeah. now I know what it is, it's a, it's a barred owl. Uh, or now I know what that sound is that yeah. I was hearing out there. What about bird feeders? Um, do they attract these critters? The, I, I'm not sure if it's the, the feed or the mm -hmm. fact that you've got other birds there and they're coming in to, to catch those other I've birds. I've seen hawks or the mice. Yes. through. Oh, yeah. There aren't that many hawks that stay around in the winter. No. in Minnesota, but the, the red tail does, of course, and uh, so I'm thinking uh, that that's mostly hawks, but it could have been owls, but of course at night they're night feeders. Yeah, so. whether or not they were actually at the feeder or just uh, waiting by the feeder for, yeah, uh, for prey something. is yeah. probably okay. more likely the case. Excellent. Anything else? No, I, I, as I mentioned, I do have to give presentations like this. I really appreciate this opportunity. It's great to have you. But if people are interested in, in my giving a presentation, I'd be more than happy to if they want to contact me. As I say, it's one of the requirements to have my permit. Sure. So I'm more than happy to, to give those presentations. Yeah. I enjoy them and I learn a lot as much as anybody else. Well, contact Evan Spencer or ICTV. We'll uh, get the word out for you. Sure. And uh, somebody might be pretty interested. In Good. Like this. So Good. I appreciate you coming. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's been wonderful. I Great. really had a lot of fun. Good. And thank you folks for watching uh, Just Outdoors on ICTV. This is a program to bring you the bare facts about the woods, the waters, and the wildlife of Itasca County. This is part of it. And I thank you again, and we'll see you next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.